The interesting common fact that surrounded all of their backgrounds was that all of them had wanted to fly. There has never been in the course of time more inspiring words written than those that read that all men are created equal. Sadly, for many, these same words proved a hollow promise left to echo in time, resounding as a mockery of inequality that would demand years of struggle overshadowed by bitter disappointment. Equality was to remain an elusive dream. The dim light of hope never blazed brighter for black Americans than during an era in American history when they began challenging the discriminatory practices of the armed forces. Key to the demands of major black organizations, such as the NAACP, the National Urban League, and others, was for the designation of centers where Negroes could be trained for work in all branches of the Aviation Corps. It was not enough to train pilots alone but navigators, bombardiers, gunners, radio men, and even mechanics. Under this collective pressure, Congress made concessions by passing Public Law 18. Under its directive, an air school to prepare blacks for military service was authorized. 91 of the 100 young Negro college students enrolled in the civilian pilot training program qualified for civil licenses during 1939 and 1940. In spite of all these facts, the Army Air Corps refused to alter its stand and allow blacks to fly. In 1941, with guidance from the NAACP, a Howard University student named Yancey Williams filed suit against the War Department to compel his admission to an air training center. Almost immediately, the War Department responded by announcing that it would establish an air unit near Tuskegee Institute, Alabama. 99th Pursuit Squadron. Activated March 21st, 1941, the Fighting 99th began training ground support troops at Chanute Field, Illinois. Eager young black Americans received specialized training in maintenance engineering, armament, and communications. Just a few months later, an inaugural address was given at the Tuskegee Institute, initiating the training of black aviators for the United States Army Air Corps. This hard-fought privilege brought with it a great responsibility. The nation was watching, and the fate of future black military aviation rested in the hands of these intrepid young flyers. In a bold and inspiring departure from the expected, the contract for construction of Tuskegee Army Airfield was awarded to the firm of McKissick and McKissick, headed by a black architect and engineer. In July, construction began on the facility for basic and advanced flying training. The first class for pilots consisted of 12 cadets and one military officer. Captain Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. It commenced primary flying training July 19, 1941, at Moton Field. Soon, young Tuskegee graduates would show the world they could not only fly, but fight. Shortly after graduating in the first class of 1942, Second Lieutenant Charles DeBow was stopped on the street by a white civilian and asked, you one of those new colored flyers over at Tuskegee? He proudly answered that he was. Tell me one thing, what do you boys want to fly for anyhow? He was asked. Shocked but not surprised, DeBose said he couldn't really think of an adequate answer at the time, but afterward realized the simple elegance of his answer. He was flying for his country. He felt he had a job to do for his country and his race. And just as Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver had proven themselves as 
educator, and scientist, he might prove to someone that Negroes could become good pilots and officers. Armed only with their bravery and determination, fueled by dreams of dignity for others like themselves, Lieutenant DeBow and four of his fellow pioneers, Captain Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., Second Lieutenant Lemuel R. Cuscus, Second Lieutenant George S. Roberts, and Second Lieutenant Mac Ross, became the first graduates paving the way for the other 961 black military aviators who were trained at Tuskegee Army Airfield during World War II. Under the command of Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., 450 of the graduates served as fighter pilots, attaining dignity and glory in the aerial war over North Africa, Sicily, and Europe. Flying P-40s, P-39s, P-47s, and P-51 type aircraft, the 99th Squadron became the 332nd Fighter Group, which also included the 100th, 301st, and 302nd Fighter Squadrons. Together, they flew 15,553 sorties and completed 1,578 missions with the 12th Tactical U.S. Army Air Force and the 15th Strategic U.S. Army Air Force. And with each and every mission, yet another victory was achieved not just for the nation, but for a people as well. The interesting common fact that surrounded all of their backgrounds was that all of them had wanted to fly. Well, I started out with these young people back in a black air force in Europe in World War II. Performance is the absolute key in combat. To protect the bombers, to prevent them from getting shot down by enemy fighters, the 99th Pursuit Squadron was an expert in dropping bombs and hitting targets and hitting locomotives. It was also an expert in aerial combat. The 99th Squadron did one thing at Anzio that no other squadron did. It shot down 16 enemy airplanes. Uh, yesterday, I fulfilled one of my ambitions as a combat pilot. I got one airplane. This was my country. I wanted a piece of it. I had to fight for it. But I'll be damned if I was going to let some other country come in and take it over. Though no real plans had been made for their usage, by mid-1943, Negro candidates were being screened to determine their relative aptitude as pilots for multi-engine aircraft, as well as bombardiers and navigators. Class 43J was the first at Tuskegee with about half of its members training in the multi-engine Beechcraft AT-10, hoping that the bomb group program would actually develop. The first air cadets to train outside Tuskegee were the navigators who graduated at Hondo Field, Texas, February 26, 1944. The 477th Bombardment Group was officially activated January 15, 1944 at Selfridge Field. Although the 477th never entered combat due to the war's end, their struggle for equality and performance as military professionals, along with the magnificent wartime record of the 99th and 332nd, led to a reversal of the U.S. War Department's racial policies. In 1946, Tuskegee Army Airfield closed. Shortly after its closing, the former base commander, Colonel Noel Parrish, in discussing the success of the flying school, said the following. How good were our pilots? How good is any pilot? Our men were good enough to graduate from any flying school in the country. We made sure of that. And working together, we proved it. We emphasized that a pilot or a man of whatever color size or shape is just as good as he proves himself to be. Men and pilots have to be considered as individuals. We have had some of the worst pilots in the world right here, and we have had some of the best. In the first place, they flew and fought as men. 
They may have had pretty good alibis for being failures if they wanted to use these alibis. Or they may have been proud of their group as the only one like it in the world, as they had a right to be. But when the test came, they had to fly and fight just as men. Americans against a common enemy. Today, there are over 425,000 black Americans serving in the armed forces as an integral part of the defense of this great nation. Their position in the military, their communities, and indeed the world has been attained and preserved through achievement and honor, the direct result of commitment to their ideals and dedication to their dreams. In the early days at Tuskegee, in addition to the already difficult job of flying, we trained under the additional pressures of segregation, but we had no time for self-pity or despair. We were too busy preparing ourselves for a career of service to our nation. The state of our fully integrated Air Force today is a pretty good indication that we did a good job. But that doesn't mean that the future will be a rose garden, or that there will not be other obstacles to overcome. Freedom must be repurchased by every new generation. When the Tuskegee Flying Program was offered to America's black youngsters, we were ready. We had prepared ourselves for this opportunity, and when it presented itself, we grabbed it with both hands. Prepare yourself so that when your Tuskegee appears, you will be ready. Freedom must be repurchased by every new generation. Prepare yourself so that when your Tuskegee appears, you will be ready. 